Welcome again to our series on special care dentistry, particularly for the Southeast Asia region. And today we have uh, Professor Callum Durwood, um, Dean of the Dental School at the University of Potisastra. Um, Callum, welcome. And we look forward to your lecture on uh, managing patients with bleeding disorders in the dental surgery. We also have on the panel, Dr. Jacob, Jacob Johns, who from the University of Malay, and Jacob, welcome. So Callum, we hand over to you. We look forward to listening to your lecture. Thanks very much. Welcome to part two of our series, um, which is looking at patients with bleeding disorders. The learning objectives, on completion of this section, participants should be able to describe bleeding orders of concern, assess and manage such patients in the dental chair and refer if appropriate, and communicate with medical practitioners about patients with bleeding disorders. Why is it important for dentists to know about bleeding disorders? Well, dentists may be called on to treat patients who have bleeding disorders and also to manage patients who have excessive bleeding after extraction or surgery. Most people who have prolonged bleeding after extractions or surgery do not have a bleeding disorder and can be managed with local measures and do not normally require blood tests or referral. Whether a patient with a bleeding disorder experiences excessive bleeding during or after dental surgery depends largely on the type and severity of the bleeding disorder. A careful assessment and planning is necessary prior to surgical treatment of patients with bleeding disorders. And this may involve communicating with the patient's medical practitioner or hematologist. The medical history is very important and should contain questions on bleeding. Has there been any significant or prolonged bleeding after previous injury, surgery or extraction? Do they have frequent nosebleeds or heavy menstrual periods? Is there any family history of bleeding or are they taking any medications which cause bleeding, for example, anticoagulants? Do they have liver disease or hypertension, which can also predispose to bleeding? In some cases, blood tests may be needed, and these can include bleeding time, APTT, PT, platelet count, or INR. We need to understand the normal hemostasis. After a blood vessel injury, there can be three mechanisms to help um, with hemostasis. Firstly, we have blood vessel constriction. We also have platelet activation and activation of the coagulation system. This results initially in a primary hemostatic plug. And after fibrin and thrombin are laid down, um, along with reduced blood flow, we get a stable hemostatic plug. There are four main types of bleeding disorders coagulation factor deficiencies, platelet disorders, vascular disorders, and fibrinolytic defects. We're going to focus on the first two in this lecture. Coagulation factor deficiencies can be divided into two groups, haemophilia A and B and von Willebrand's disease are congenital disorders whereas liver disease, vitamin K deficiency, and medications such as warfarin and aspirin are acquired. Haemophilia A is usually inherited 
and it's an X-linked recessive condition affecting males, although females can be carriers. There may be a history of multiple bleeding incidents. Severe hemophiliacs may have bled into joints, limiting their mobility. Most people with severe haemophilia require regular supplementation with intravenous recombinant or plasma concentrate factor 8. Some individuals with severe haemophilia and most of those with moderate and mild haemophilia are given factor 8 only as needed without a regular prophylactic schedule. Mild haemophiliacs often manage their condition with desmopressin, a drug which releases stored factor VIII from blood vessel walls. It's important to note that about 15% of patients with haemophilia develop antibodies to factor VIII, and this makes their management more difficult. Haemophilia B, or factor IX deficiency, is also called Christmas disease. They bleed in a similar way to Haemophilia A patients. However, their condition may be, in many cases, less severe. Von Willebrand's disease is the most common hereditary coagulation disorder. Both males and females are affected and there's a wide range of severity from mild to severe. We get prolonged bleeding in these patients. Factor VIII activity is decreased and platelets don't adhere to each other. Liver disease can be another cause of bleeding. In this case, synthesis of clotting factors is impaired. Sometimes bleeding can be controlled with vitamin K or fresh frozen plasma. For these patients, we, we may need to consider reducing the prescribed drug dosages. Common causes of liver disease are hepatitis C, hepatitis B, and alcoholism. The liver goes through a number of stages from being healthy to having fatty liver, to fibrosis of the liver, and finally cirrhosis of the liver. Platelet disorders are in two main types, quantitative, and here we're referring to thrombocytopenia, and qualitative, which are platelet function disorders. Thrombocytopenia is defined as having less than 150 times 10 to the 9 platelets per litre. And there are three types. Idiopathic, the main one being immune thrombocytopenia purpura or ITP, which is an autoimmune condition, usually following a viral condition or viral illness. There's also thrombocytopenia caused by drugs, such as patients having chemotherapy or radiotherapy or the drug valproic acid. And some blood disorders and malignancies, such as leukemia, can also cause thrombocytopenia. Qualitative conditions include um, congenital, such as von Willebrand's disease, and acquired, drug-induced liver disease and alcoholism. The minimum platelet blood level before oral surgery should be at least 50,000 per microliter. In severe cases, the patient may need a blood transfusion before invasive treatment. Blood disorders can present in a number of ways. It depends on the type of bleeding disorder. Sometimes we see 
frequent large bruises or ecchymosis. We can also see petechiae or purpura, bleeding under the skin or mucosa, causing tiny purple, red or brown spots. There can also be redness, swelling or stiffness and pain from bleeding into muscles or joints, which is particularly common with severe haemophilia. And bleeding nose is also a common feature. Orally, the presentation depends on the type and severity of the bleeding disorder and can include excessive or prolonged bleeding after extractions or surgery, spontaneous gingival bleeding, or petechiae purpura or ecchymosis in the mucosal tissues, such as shown here on the palate. Patients with bleeding disorders may first be diagnosed following oral bleeding. One study in the United States found that 14% of all haemophilia patients and 30% of cases with a mild type of haemophilia were diagnosed early following an episode of severe oral bleeding, of which the most common sites were the labial frenum and the tongue. So dentists are in a good position to identify some of these patients. Bleeding in the presence of gingival overgrowth may indicate an underlying hematological malignancy, such as leukemia. Patients with bleeding disorders do have oral health issues. The chronic bleeding of the gingiva may cause brown staining of the teeth. Patients may have more dental caries and periodontal disease and may lack effective oral hygiene and professional care. This can be due to a fear of causing oral bleeding, so they may neglect to avoid or avoid brushing their teeth or avoid going to the dentist because of a fear of oral bleeding that may occur. In addition, many dentists may be reluctant to see patients with bleeding problems. Management of bleeding disorders in the dental clinic um, will depend on the type and the severity of the bleeding disorder. For non-invasive dental care, this is normally safe. We often need to communicate with the patient's medical doctor and sometimes the haematologist. Use a minimally invasive approach to minimize trauma during surgery. If there's a severe bleeding disorder, endodontics is preferred over extraction. If the patient has a severe coagulopathy, transfusion of appropriate factors to 50 to 100% of normal levels is often required. And this must be continued postoperatively um, for some period. Of course, we must also use local hemostatic measures such as pressure, sutures, hemostatic foam, and a tranexamic acid mouthwash. We should avoid prescribing aspirin and other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs to these patients. And there should be a strong emphasis on prevention and oral health education so that their treatment needs are minimal. Injections in patients with severe bleeding disorders is an area of concern. We should avoid mandibular blocks or lingual injections in patients with a severe coagulopathy, as there's a risk of hematoma or swelling in the retromolar or pterygoid space, leading to airway blockage. There's less danger if the clotting factor levels have been raised 
by appropriate replacement therapy. In these cases, we should use more infiltration and intraligamentary injections, <coughs> and also use articane. Local anesthetic that's used should contain vasoconstrictor. Here are some of the local hemostatic agents. Gel foam or absorbent gelatin sponge material that can be put into sockets, for example. Oxidized cellulose, such as surgery cell. Fibrin sealin, such as tissue. Topical thrombin and tranexamic acid, which is an antifibrinolytic mouthwash, which supports clot formation. Tranexamic acid can come either as an injectable solution, which can be used as a mouth rinse, or as tablets. And if using tablets, crush the tablet up and mix it with about 10 mils of water or saline and use that to rinse. For the systemic management of patients with bleeding disorders, the hematologist has a number of options. Platelets can be transfused if patients have less than 10,000 per millimeter cubed. Um, fresh frozen plasma and cryoprecipitate may be given IV and these contain coagulation factors. So this might be used in cases of severe liver disease or an undiagnosed bleeding disorder with active bleeding. Factor eight concentrate can be given to patients with hemophilia A, um, either with active bleeding or pre-surgery. And also for some patients with von, von Willebrand's disease. Factor nine concentrate may be given in patients with hemophilia B. <clears throat> and in certain bleeding disorders, such as aplastic anemia and liver disease, amino caproic acid can be given, which slows the breakdown of blood clots. Finally, for patients with von Willebrand's disease and mild hemophilia A, DDAVP may be given which increases the amount of factor eight and von Willebrand's factor circulating in the blood. For the dental management of bleeding disorders, if the disorder is mild and we're doing non-invasive procedures, there can be slight modifications or no modifications needed. If the bleeding disorder is severe, and we're planning invasive procedures, the aim is to restore the hemostatic system to acceptable levels and maintain hemostasis by local and adjunctive methods. In these cases, we should consult the patient's doctor. For drug-induced coagulopathies, such as where the patient is taking warfarin or heparin, we should stop or modify the drugs um, prior to the appointment. Um, with heparin, the drug may be stopped by the doctor. For warfarin, the dosage can be reduced. So in patients taking warfarin, before the appointment, we need to know the patient's INR. The normal INR in warfarinized patients is between two and three. And dentists can carry out most minor surgical procedures, such as extractions, if the INR is less than 3.5. If the INR is more than 3.5, we should consult with the doctor and suggest that they can reduce the dose of warfarin um, and then later measure the INR again. Local measures to control bleeding should be put in place, including a tranexamic mouthwash for two days.
in summary, bleeding disorders can impact on our treatment planning and management and may pose a serious risk to these patients. Communication with the patient's doctor is important and most patients with mild to moderate coagulopathies and platelet disorders can be managed with local measures. Severe bleeding disorders may require platelet or factor transfusions, and these should be managed by a hematologist. Prevention is very important in these patients. Here is some further reading if you're interested. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much for that lecture uh, on uh, management of patients with bleeding disorders. It was very comprehensive, so thank you for that. Um, now we have a time for uh, questions and answers. Jacob, are there any questions or comments you would like to ask? Uh, thank you, Prof. Kala, for the, the lecture. I just want to know, um, um, uh, normally the patients who come to us, uh, they do not give us a proper medical history. Okay, okay. stop. Start, <laughs> start again, okay? okay. <laughs> start again, okay. Um, yes, sir. Jacob, is there any comments or questions you would like to ask? Uh, Prof. Kalam, I just want to know, uh, in, in no, normally our patients here, when they come to our dental clinic, they, they do not give us a proper medical history. So in, in those kind of situations, what, what will happen if uh, we, we do not gather the information and then we proceed with our uh, management? And how, how, what are the next steps that needs to be, be taken, for example, a patient is with bleeding disorders? Well, of course, we do need to try and take an accurate medical history. And if the patient is unable to give us one, I think we need to inquire further. Sometimes it may be family members if um, they can help. Um, but if we believe that there may be some underlying medical problem that the patient has not been able to share with us, then I think it's our responsibility to contact their doctor with the permission of the patient um, and investigate that way. Um, obviously, some things that we do in the mouth are very low risk. For example, no risk of bleeding with certain things we do. And we can probably proceed to do some of those things without risk. But if we were going to do um, an extraction or surgery, and we felt that we weren't able to get a, um, an accurate history about bleed, possible bleeding problems, then we should delay that treatment until we have more information. Thank you. Callum, uh, one of the most nerve-wracking situations for um, a dental student or a dentist is giving a local anesthetic in a patient with a history of bleeding disorders. Um, thank you for clarifying about um, a mandibular block and a lingual nerve, but do you feel that an infiltration is relatively safe um, to, to undertake? Yes, and I think we need to consider the patient and their medical history. For example, if they are um, a severe hemophiliac, but they're taking replacement therapy, either prophylactically, like every day, or if they're taking it just for the occasion of their visit, as long as their factor levels are good, there's very little risk of bleeding, excessive bleeding from our local anesthetic injections, especially infiltrations. Um, if they are mild, if they have a mild um, condition, um, then the, the infiltration injections are very unlikely to result in a, an internal bleed that will be of concern. Um, and 
injections on the outer surfaces um, are much less risky than those on the inside surfaces, such as the IDB or lingual injections. So I think we can be fairly sure that it's going to be okay. Um, Good, no, thank you very much. I suppose we're all uh, absolutely committed and uh, convinced that prevention is really important for these patients. Uh, normally in the UK, we have recalls for uh, children and, and adults as well for every six months. So patients come on a six monthly basis. Would you recommend that someone with a history of bleeding disorders actually has a, a shorter recall interval? I think I would combine their medical history, um, their bleeding disorder with their caries risk history or the speed at which they build up calculus, for example. And I would certainly say that if they were high caries risk or had a lot of periodontal problems and a bleeding disorder, then coming more regularly might be a very good idea. Um, at, that, at those regular visits, um, we can do prevention. For example, we can apply fluorides and sealants and do simple cleaning um, very safely. Um, if we extend the visits, then we can't do prevention so often. They may end up with more problems that are more challenging to treat. So yes, I think we need to consider both the medical history as well as the caries risk. Good, thank you very much. Jacob, any last questions or comments? Prof. Uh, Kalam, uh, normally what we do for uh, uh, post extraction or uh, any minor oral surgery, we have got instructions that we give to our patients. Any specific instructions that need to be given to patients with bleeding disorders post uh, treatment? Yes, well, we should give all the normal instructions, but I think that if they had any continued bleeding, um, then they, they must contact us quite quickly um, so that that can be addressed. The other thing that we always, or in a lot of cases, will add to the normal instructions we give to patients would be relating to the tranexamic acid mouth rinse, which in a lot of cases is going to be very helpful in preventing ongoing bleeding. Okay, thank you so much. Callum, thank you for an excellent lecture again. And um, I think that the students and the dentists who actually are treating will find this, uh, the contents of your lecture really helpful. So thank you again. Thank you, you're welcome.